Perfect. Uh, hello. Welcome to the Museum of World Culture. I can say since my daily practice is in part being a curator here, and my other part is being a researcher at the museum, at the university in the history of ideas, uh, and that we will most probably show in my presentation, uh, which is really just to try to set the word decolonization in a theoretical concept. Uh, context, you might say, uh, related to the post-colonial, and uh, seeing how that uh, works together. Uh, so I have quite some text, so you should look more there than to me, and uh, we'll get going to see where we are. So, uh, when these questions started, uh, it was the term post-colonialism that was mainly used, at least in English. Uh, the colonial thinking coming more from a Latin American and Spanish context. So the three, the triumvirate of uh, post-colonial thinkers with the three main books, Edward Said and Orientalism, uh, Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak, with, in other words, and uh, one that is a bit blurry. Uh, Homi Baba, the location of culture. The last one of this, uh, Homi Baba, is from 1994, so it's quite an old uh, context in a way. Uh, and it's not that easy to delineate you know, what post colonialism is, especially today. So these books are still referenced quite a lot, but um, uh, maybe the field has broadened. It started a lot in literature, but also went into art history, social sciences, and uh, humanities as questions of the Western traditional knowledge, as uh, Edward Said's uh, sequel to Orientalism, uh, culture and imperialism, showed that there were connections deep within the way of knowing within the West that uh, were related to uh, colonialism. <coughs> So it's, you could say, about exploring how the global relations of imperialism, dominance and subordination has affected a lot of thinking and understanding, not only within museums, but within uh, social sciences and humanities, uh, and trying to see how we can break with that colonial legacy. Uh, but as said, that is a field that is not developed that much under the name of post-colonialism uh, today. So it has uh, maybe went into or at least relates to fields such as subaltern studies, a more historical investigation, how the subjects of colonialism uh, experienced history, intersectionality studies that has grown to show the intersections between race, class, uh, gender, and so on. Uh, critical race studies that uh, is uh, now being introduced a lot into Sweden uh, with a, a new research grant just being delivered uh, related to white studies. So how do you understand race today? How does it affect uh, relations even if uh, the biology of race studies is not there anymore. So that before we talk about critical race studies, how is subordination today still affected by the old understandings of race, how people are racialized and so on. Uh, it's also connections with uh, the more material and uh, Marxist uh, oriented uh, world system theories, uh, looking on how well, the world has been connected, and then decolonization theory, which we will come to. And uh, this, of course, has affected museums a lot, even if uh, different museums have been uh, well, differently, how, how keen they have been to introduce these perspectives. Uh, <clears throat> the top of the museum sector, you might say, uh, the International Council of Museums. Uh, it's 
it's often said that uh, in 1984 they started to open for this newer approaches, uh, what is often called as new museology within the museum studies field, and the Quebec uh, Declaration where the social mandate of museum was uh, highlighted, and there is at least a terminological uh, opening to post-colonial voices, which is more of a temporal uh, term in that case, that it's uh, from after the colonies rather than the theoretical uh, content of a post-colonial perspective. Uh, so, we, and I think we still talk a lot about that, that was previously taken for granted, which we have been saying since the, since the 80s, which is interesting also how the museum talk about itself, that we maybe need to start uh, changing our way of understanding that we are just about to, to depart from something that we previously took for granted, because most of us didn't even work within the museums in those days. Uh, anyway, uh, post-colonial themes were introduced uh, into uh, museum discourse, uh, maybe first from what I found by Annie Coombs, uh, who uh, uh, tried to engage with the uh, ideas of hybridity and so on in 1998. Uh, of course, you can debate if there is other examples. Um, and it, since then, you might say it's been popular to talk about the museum in a post way and saying that we have left this previously taken for granted thing and we can talk about that as a post colonial term. Uh, it's happening, but it's also related to a lot of other ways of trying to describe this new kind of museum, uh, and these are just some of the recent uh, ways of uh, calling a not taken for granted narrative of Western supremacy, you might say. Uh, Human Gurion, who worked in a Jewish museum, called it a civilized museum. Might sound strange, but she is into something the same. A radical museum, a democratic museum, a reform museum, a public museum, the people's museum, transformed museum, a heterotopic museum, a Foucaultian uh, term for that, or a post-museum. Uh, and what uh, you can find in all these different ways of talking about uh, the museum that is somewhat related to post-colonial references and thinking uh, might be said to be collected in the book, The Post-Colonial Museum. Uh, it was a big project called European Museums in an Age of Migration. Uh, Italian-run uh, uh, project and they had this conference that resulted in the book uh, which tries to sum up what this might be. And my reading of this would say that the term post-colonial is most often not a critical concept within museum discourse. It's rather quite a celebratory term that uh, says that we are not part of that old stuff anymore. We are a new kind of museum. We are a post-colonial museum. And uh, I think I've maybe said that uh, in this house uh, sometimes also. So we are a good example of this uh, trying to say that we are past, oh, sorry, past the old things. Uh, but as uh, the uh, editors of the new big handbook of museum studies uh, state, Andy Coombs, still active, uh, and Ruth Phillips, that uh, while governments are closing their borders, marginalizing immigrants with neo-colonial policies, and at the same time, museums celebrate world culture and a post-colonial museum ideal. What does that really mean? We are a state institution 
So how does our celebration of being post-colonial or decolonial relate to other parts of state policy? Uh, and uh, how should mu museums treat and how should artists coming into uh, public institutions uh, treating being part of public policy? Uh, it might be some problems there. Uh, so. That is uh, what we have time to say for the post-colonial. So, uh, I would say that uh, the last couple of years, maybe five years, something, uh, the term decolonial has become more popular than the post-colonial. Uh, and uh, is that just a change of terms, or is it a new concept? I would say in the museum world, it is a big difference. Uh, that, uh, as I tried to say in my title of the speak, that uh, post-colonial is a very theoretical concept, while decolonial is much more a description of uh, methodologies and practice. Uh, how we work with the collections, how we view uh, indigenous knowledge, how we uh, view participation of people that has relations to our collections and so on. So I, I would say that it's quite a different thing. Um, the quote is taken from the Decolonial Aesthetics Manifesto, trying to show what the decolonial thinking and doing, so that's a big change. Uh, Post-colonial doing is an unheard of concept almost. Uh, so that was a lot of thinking, now we are turning more into doing. So to continue re-inscribing, embodying, dignifying those ways of living, thinking and sensing that were violently devalued and demonized by colonial, imperial and interventionist agendas as well as by postmodern and ultra-modern internal critiques, which is of course uh, also entails post-colonial critiques that it was still a very western introspection on how are we still formed by the colonial experience. So it was uh, still uh, looking at how Western domination is affecting the world still. And uh, the thrust of the colonial thinking then is rather how to re-inscribe and dignify those ways of living that were suppressed. Is that possible? How can it be done? Uh, can they be retraced? And I said, I mean, especially in an ethnographic museum, we have a lot of those traces. And are they, are they forever suppressed by being moved into a museum storage collection when they are taken out of context? Or can they be reconnected to those ways of non knowing and being <coughs> re-inscribed with dignity? And I think that's a theme that we will come back to in quite a few of the presentations. Uh, but of course, even if I would say it's a positive term for museums, it goes into practice rather than just trying to talk about thinking differently. Uh, there are, of course, also critiques of this term. Uh, one that was much celebrated uh, when it came two years ago, by people, three years ago even now, by people like Slavoj Cicic and so on, uh, was this book by Vivek Schippe, uh, Indian-born uh, sociologist, uh, post-colonial theory and the specter of capital, uh, and he mixes decolonial, post-colonial, subaltern in, in the same package. Uh, but his main critique is that global exploitation, which is what we're trying to counter in some way, you would say, is an effect of the universalized logic of capital. So it's about capitalism, and it's a universal predicament that unites all global citizens and cultural differences do not explain or address this problem. It's just a liberal uh, pseudo discussion, is that we have to unite as a universal uh, working class, you might say. Uh, so the end where he is maybe not only tied into his more Marxist 
way of understanding the thing is the critique that the idea that we can only speak for ourselves, which he sees as embedded in the colonial practice and thinking, dismantles the possibility of solidarity as well as a political alliance of global citizens. So how can we create those alliances that can have a political impact if we only concentrate on the dignity of the individual speaker that should represent themselves? I think that's an interesting and valid critique that we can bear with us during the days and see uh, how valid it is and how we can meet it. Another aspect of this, uh, one of the books about uh, Edward Said, but it's a saying that he uses sometimes that the role of the intellectual is speaking truth to power, but in the decolonial setting where it's about uh, giving dignity and showing that there are different ways of knowing. So in the world where we in the end get pluriversal ontologies, uh, we come from different ontologies, we have different epistemologies with us, and can we have uh, an understanding of what truth means? Or if we come to competing truth claims, where do we end? And I mean, I would say this relates to like the U.S. elections. Uh, what is the role of truth? And of course, that truth has always been not that connected to rational arguments, but to authority. We believe in things because people say they are true, not because we get the reason behind it. But if we have a pluriversal understanding of what we take as authority and as what we hold as true, how can we judge if they are competing cl truth claims and can we say that one truth is more important than others? What kind of arguments do we have uh, with this? So that's uh, some points of uh, critique, uh, not that they uh, say falters uh, the uh, the colonial practice, but it opens interesting and problems to solve or address. Uh, and uh, well, as I said before, the colonial perspectives have been influential in developing methods for collection management, especially while the term post-colonial museums is mainly used when talking about exhibitions and the museum space. So that's also an interesting divide, I think, that the people that talks about the audience and the social impact of the museum as a public place, they are more in the post-colonial debate, while the decolonial perspectives are very much tied to, to the work with collections and so on, and not so much with the local community that visits the museums. So uh, that's also a challenge to bring these two perspectives together and see how they can relate to each other and maybe strengthen each other. Uh, and just to end my presentations, I thought I should take two perspectives maybe that are working within similar fields but not under the labels of uh, post-colonial or decolonial a man that has been connected to the post-colonial discourse since the uh, start, in a way, is James Clifford, anthropologist from uh, Santa Cruz, uh, who is now talking about, a lot about that there's an intentionality of counter-hegemonic and indigenous actors, and a way to address this rather than a purely decolonial perspective, he would say, is to recognize the overlapping but discrepant histories that struggle for room. So there's always this struggle of different discrepant histories that is connected to the objects in the museum, to the different uh, indigenous uh, actors. And he uses the concepts of articulation, performance, and translations to try to uh, build narratives that can 
open for all these different overlapping histories that can't be brought into uh, any unison, but it should, should be treated as discrepant histories, and uh, where the decolonial voice is only one, you might say, or a few. Uh, and uh, another attempt uh, uh, in similar lines is uh, Rodney Harrison, who also talks a lot about assemblages that we are going to move into soon in the first panel. So I thought that would be a good like, bridge into that. Uh, who says that any attempt to order, categorize, and explain the world will always be incomplete and create systems of value not stemming from the world itself. So that, of course, goes for any effort. Uh, and uh, what he suggests is that we should try to imagine a museum system that treats all things uh, in storage as diasporic. So we try to build on diaspora thinking and the objects are here as diasporic agents. And uh, his uh, say somewhat critique of uh, the colonial uh, writing is that uh, we should refuse an understanding of agency as individual acts and instead then seeing uh, agency as something that is distributed across collectives. So similarly to Clifford he is trying to find a way how to not change perspectives but to uh, make different perspectives uh, overlap. Uh, but I would say that in all these uh, efforts, apart from Schipper, who wants a, a true Marxist uh, understanding of the world uh, and a global solidarity, where every talk of culture is just uh, leading us astray from the material, pure aspects of political struggle. Uh, all the others, I would say, the colonial methods are a part of what they need to do in order to create these uh, uh, overlaying uh, stories or the distribution of uh, agency. So the question is not do we need the colonial methods within museums, but how far do they take us uh, and how will they interact with the other perspectives that are more uh, open for the community that visits the museum and the other stories that also relate to the different layers of uh, the collections and so on. And with that I hope uh, we have some like uh, format for the concepts that will rise and uh, that we shall discuss. Uh, and of course this was not so much my own thinking, but taken from a lot of books. So this is <laughs> the bibliography that maybe it's difficult to read. But I imagine this will be published somewhere, so you can find it. Uh, and with that, since I'm going to moderate this next uh, panel, I should quit, so we are in time. Thank you.